All right, welcome back to our podcast, or as we like to say, CoreCast, with Linda McNutt Foster with Cortex Leadership Consulting. And again, I am Becky Freemall with WFXR, our Virginia at Work segment. Um, and with us, all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, dun, 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 ha, uh, it's like Max Headroom right here, Ron <laughs> Bonstetter. <laughs> he is a Senior VP of Research and Development with the Target Training International Success Insights, TTI, I guess we could say, Ron, is that right? That's the abbreviation most people use. We'll go with that. You know, and let's start with that very simple question, Ron, which is what is TTI? What is it the, the core of what the company does? Well, TTI SI really uh, is a company that helps uh, with the selection of uh, new employees and the professional development of existing employees, as well as just partnering and teaming and getting people to be able to communicate with each other and understand the uniqueness of each individual. And talk about the importance of doing this. You said you guys started this company back in the 80s. Uh, what was the need? What was the void? Weren't people already able to do this on their own? No. You know, there are gut-level feelings that each of us have about who we are and how we interact with others. But until that actually is exposed and put into a language that we can share, uh, it remains a gut-level feeling. And so TTI and a number of assessment companies that do this are able to give voice to behaviors, to driving forces, to actually the things that uh, that make a difference in a communication. And when it comes to hiring, we, we really know that people that are hired based on a resume and years of experience many times fail because they didn't take into consideration all of those other components that you bring with you. You see, you bring all these personal attributes and behaviors and motivators to the job. They're not just left at home. So we have to figure out how you fit into a culture, how you uh, align with the culture of a business, and how you align with others in a communication. You know, and Linda, obviously you use TTI Cortex Leadership. You are an executive consultant for several corporations in our area. How are they using TTI and how have you seen it make a difference? We use TTI in so many different ways with leaders and their teams. So we use it um, when people are applying as a portion of the decision making process to go is this person's pace in relationship with the pace of the job that they're going to have is their focus going to be the focus that we need them to have uh, one of my favorite parts of TTI's assessments are motivators what's going to motivate that person so are you putting uh, a salesperson in a job and are they motivated to get a high return on investment or is that a low motivator for them so are they going to have a problem closing so to me it's just a fast track way to quickly be able to get to the heart of whether this is the right role match. The other way we use it is be, to be able to take everybody on the team, do a bunch of assessments, and then um, TTI has, has these amazing wheels that in a quick visual snapshot can show you um, what pace everybody's going to work at. Is it a well-rounded team or is it heavy in one area versus another? Um, when it comes to motivators, is everybody motivated by the same thing? Do you want that or not? So to me, it's become, and the science that they use it for, he here's the thing is, we do we give it to everyone we coach everyone we train almost gets one of these so we've done about 2500 of them at this point and the the people when we ask them in class about 80 percent of the people say it's 80 percent accurate about them wow yeah they're kind of shocked that in <laughs> a 20 minute assessment that it can nail them. And I can tell you this, 90% of the people, you know, say that it's 70%. And then there's like, by the time you get to 60%, 60% of the people are like, I can't even put a red ink on this thing. In these 50 pages, how did you know this was me? So it's a coaching tool. So it's an ability to meet with somebody very quickly and be able to go, is this true about you? Yes, it's true about you. Let's talk about you know, where you'd like to be, what your maximum contribution potential is based on these behaviors, based on these motivators and where you are right now. Ron, how did you, TTI I should say, I'm sure you had lots of help. Um, how did the team come up with this from the very beginning? How did, how did this come to fruition so that it worked so well? It's kind of scary, not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> Becky's taking one. Yes. I'm taking yeah. one. He's taking well, one. She's like, how'd you I, do this to me? I got, how'd you know this exactly. about me? Yeah. <laughs> 
I would say that we uh, we are on the shoulders of giants because we didn't create a lot of this. You, you go back to the behaviors, for example, uh, a Harvard professor by the name of Marston really did a lot of the groundwork that laid the groundwork for what we do with behaviors. Uh, Spranger uh, from Germany did much the same with our motivators and driving forces. So we're really tied into uh, almost 100 years of of thinking about this and writings and research. So we've been really able to piggyback on a lot of expertise. And keep in mind, our database allows us to do continuously do updates and research and to refine the instruments. Uh, that's one thing that's probably frustrating with a lot of our uh, consultants because they like to just get a tool and use it and not have to really think about changes. I have to keep reminding them that we are a software company and by definition, that means uh, you still wouldn't want to be using Windows 3. You'd want to <laughs> use something that's been updated. And so we're constantly improving. That's actually, that's why I choose to use, like you guys, because of you, because you're a brain science background, because you're coming out with innovative devices to like be able to measure people's prefrontal cortex. And because you're constantly changing and updating that's why I use TTI. I, I think you guys are the best global providers of this type of work. And what's a sort of a fact that's interesting is uh, the matching, you know, you have these companies that are matching. Ha weren't there companies that started out using TTI's assessments? It wasn't, it wasn't match.com, right? It was uh, right? Well, yeah, you could go back to the conversations that my brother had with a, with a, a Dr. Dean and uh, eHarmony.com uh, was uh, having conversations with TTI before that ever became a household word. Uh -huh. And we actually helped create an assessment for them. It's not the assessment they used for matching, actually. It was an assessment that was better. <laughs> when they decided you wanted to try out eHarmony.com, you had to take our assessment, the assessment was mailed to you, and here's what the, the takeaway had to be. <laughs> eHarmony wanted to be able to have people say, my goodness, if they can tell me that much about myself in 15 minutes, imagine what they could do in trying to find me a partner. Oh, like a marketing tool almost. Yeah, so it actually was the original assessment we put together for eHarmony was not the match, it was selling them on the fact that we really could identify qualities that would make a difference in the match. Well, and Ron, your marketing obviously um, has done very well because you were just sharing with us, and if you could share again, the amount of assessments that are being done around the globe at any given moment. Well, we have separate servers uh, by law. We have uh, countries that do not want data leaving their, their, their countries. But if we merge all the servers we have around the world that are isolated, uh, we are actually doing a, a report on average every seven seconds, day and night. Uh, in addition, you have to remember that we actually have our assessments in uh, 43 languages right now and over 90 countries that are participating in some manner with uh, using TTISI's assessments. So I, it, we truly are a global company. Let's talk about, and, and, and Linda, I might even let you go down this path, about the negative thought patterns. I think that the percentage that you had found, what was it, 80% of people? Yeah, so what, what was interesting to me was the, the most recent research is showing that 80% of our thoughts right, okay. are negative. That's scary. It's kind of stunning, actually, you know? And I, I thought that would be interesting to talk about with somebody who studies the brain. And what was what's fascinating to to me, Ron, is the work that you the the way that you are studying people's brains as they are taking these assessments. Because the negative, if I understood you right, um, in the trainings, the negative is so much stronger than the positive. Yeah. Uh, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how to lay all the groundwork to get right. to get to that base. We we just jumped to third base, maybe even all the way to home. Um, but I think, <laughs> Sorry, I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> I think we I think we can fill in the holes for you. If I might just take for a moment then and and try to uh, align this for a second. Okay, sure. Let's take a look at some some uh, some information that lays the groundwork. First of all. 
I really, uh, these assessments are under attack and for right reasons. They're self-reports. And so what, we really wanted to know if they're working. So I, uh, as a cognitive neurologist, took on the task uh, a number of years ago at looking actually at brainwave activity. And in front of you, you see some basic brainwave activity that can be collected through EEG. The last one is gamma. Here, sure. And the reason I'm pointing out gamma is because it's a fast wave. Hey, Ron, and it's I actually... literally. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. It's not popping up. Are on you our, seeing the screen? It's just a shot of the uh, brain, which is with its own little circle. It's still thinking. We're just yeah, it's entertaining. But I don't, I don't think that's. I no. think you were looking for a slide. Yeah, I think it's one that you just showed before, but it doesn't appear to be popping up. Why is that not coming up? Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, let's. Uh, that, that didn't work at all, folks. We're going to be cutting that out. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, we're live here. We just go. We just go. Well, and live. honestly, most oh, of this sure. for podcast is almost all audio. So for the audio part of it, you can just explain to us what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I can, but that's irritating that I can't. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to close that conversation. There you go. I'm going to stop screen, I guess. Switch screen or window. I'm just going to stop screen. There you go. Now, there, now you. we see you full screen. Hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, just it came me. Up before, but it wasn't. Okay, with that in mind, then we're just going to talk it through, all right? Okay. Let's do that. All right, so why don't we. Um, well, you don't. Why don't you just start Back up for a moment. with the. But she already yeah. asked the question, so I'll let you start where you want, and we'll do the edit there. Okay. Well, I'd like to really explain a little bit about the fact that when I started using these assessments, I was an academic. I was, spent 40 years in, uh, in education and 29 at a, at a Research One institution. And I found these assessments to be useful for my students. I found that my students, nowhere in a four-year degree did they actually learn about self. And so without having any knowledge of self, they were supposed to move forward with their life. And so I found that it was necessary to fill in the holes. I used these assessments to fill in those holes and to help them learn, but they were criticized because from an academic standpoint, uh, they were self-reports. So as a cognitive neurologist, I wanted to really see if I could trace what's going on in the brain. With that in mind, I started a process that allowed me to literally hook people up with a neural net, have them see the assessment right in front of them, literally take the assessment mentally instead of just on paper. And as in the process of doing that, I was able to capture their activity and then tying that to a research base, what we discovered is that we are able to determine what is called, an, and don't, don't lose me on this because it's just <laughs> a big words, but we're gonna be looking at the asymmetry of the prefrontal cortex, especially at the gamma wave activity. So all that amounts to is that when you see a new stimuli, you have an immediate response the immediate response is coming from gamma. The thoughtful response is coming from beta and, and uh, alpha, which is a slower wave. But I'm interested in your immediate response because the scary part is that the research indicates that about 95% of the time, your immediate response to a new concept, a new stimuli, a new trigger will end up being your final response. Interesting. Now, think about the implications of that. In other words, we have this emotional baggage. Huh. We, we have biases. Mm -hmm. We literally are in a position where we get a new income, a, a new st a stimuli, and we make a decision mentally based on the emotional response, and then we think about it. No. no. What we do is justify what we originally thought. Go with our gut. Well, yeah, our gut feeling is judging and ruling us about 95% of the time. And when we say, no, I thought about that. No, what you did is spend your time rationalizing the response that you already made. So it's sort of scary, and we're going to get into that because actually, oh, can we jump around a little bit? You see, that's what's going on in virtually every conversation right now in every Community in every bar in every household related to politics. There you go. All it takes is a trigger, and you have an emotional response that locks your thinking down. And as a result, everything after that is a threat and becomes a defensive response. 
Which is sort of backed up in the power of habit, backed up in the righteous mind. I mean, there are so many contemporary books that all say, all research says exactly the same. Like the idea that we can sort of our trigger our higher level thinking, our prefrontal cortex upon demand without training is not accurate. Like it takes a lot of behavioral coaching of ourselves, working with other people, thinking pairs to understand when we're experience anxiety right and right. how to sort of turn that off and turn that down so we actually can use our prefrontal cortex to 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 not have this justification of what we believe already but to actually change our perspective so that we can well, maybe come up with a different conclusion that's more more based on fact and information than emotion uh, yes, absolutely. But let's back up for a moment. First of all, this is not necessarily bad. I mean, you and I wouldn't be here if this component of neurology didn't exist. Because you see, this is how we deal with fight, flight, or freeze response. There is a direct connection between the senses and the motor cortex to react to these kinds of threats. So it's very positive. It saved us in the savanna. It allowed us to outrun saber-toothed tigers and to survive. <laughs> that, that's what I've been telling the class. But here, Ron, so so here's what the challenge is. Like, Look so Linda, I'm with she's you. She's getting excited now. Right. So this, <laughs> this is what's so fascinating to me, though, is it's not like drinking alcohol or not drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or not smoking cigarettes. Like, yeah. this part of our brain has kept us alive, keeps us breathing, keeps us safe. Right. So how do we go about working with this biology mm -hmm. to move to a higher level of thinking and not just go with our first gut? And I am going to politely well, cut you both off right now and say that would be a great starting point to keep people around for our next podcast. Uh, I think Good. we're going to develop that a lot. I think we are. So I think you all need to stick around because we're going to go further into that in just a moment. <laughs>